let me do a quick review. X is called embedding. It goes from the worksheet to target space that you can think of as space time and basic examples. It will not be terribly phenomenological. It will be X will be mapped from, for example, the torus to 10 dimensional flat space. It could be a cylinder or this could be, as we said, R6 times K3 or something like that. So if you really want to do more serious phenomenology, you might want R4 here, of course. And we mentioned that in passing, but I will focus mostly on simple examples like this. I wrote the action yesterday for my dx's. So in coordinates, it's x mu, and then it's dx mu. As was pointed out yesterday, it's kind of important for some purposes to write these psi terms, I call them. X was the first quantum field, and now it has a partner, psi. The main difference between them is that this is a boson. Classically, I mean, before we go to quantum field theory, they commute. If you go to coordinates, you have a collection of 10 of these, and they commute. So we can just change order at will. Whereas these fermions, they classically anti-commute. So they minus, in other words, mathematicians would say they are Grassmann numbers. A physicist at this point will say there's not enough physics going on. This is a quantum field theory statement, but what does this mean in non-relativistic quantum mechanics? In non-relativistic quantum mechanics, how does this sign lead to the shell structure of atoms? So this is Fermi-Dirac statistics, which leads to the Pauli principle. No two electrons can be in the same state, so they form shells, which is the source of life as we know it. So that's physics. And the other physics question is, the elephant in the room last time was super symmetry. This action now with this psi has a world sheet supersymmetry, which is quite different from what you may have heard about supersymmetry. This is not the most famous kind of supersymmetry, even though it was historically the first. This means that if you change the psi field by a small amount, you can introduce a anti-commuting Grassmann number epsilon, and it will vary into the boson field. Similarly, the boson field will vary into the fermion field. I'm using Polchinski conventions. If I, my notes may have small mistakes or, or huge mistakes, my basic reference, as I said before, will be Polchinski, but any textbook about string theory will have this in great detail. And these are from first pages of Polchinski volume two. Now, having this supersymmetry is a little trivial here because this is a free theory for the most part. So this is kind of trivial in a way. Supersymmetry is not trivial, but it's not so strange that a free theory, which means that its PD is linear PD, uh, has lots of symmetries. It would be more non-trivial for a non-linear theory to have this kind of symmetry. And of course, such theories exist, but I'm saying here it's a, a slightly trivial uh, situation. Now you might immediately say, well, supersymmetry does it exist in the real world. Let me argue in this sense, yes. So replace the world sheet, which is my complex variable Z, by a world line. By that, I just mean pick is conventionally usually the imaginary part, but for the sake of argument, let me pick the real part. Regular quantum field theory arises from string theory as a small sort of subset. This is at least how I think of integration. So if you took calculus at some point and you did some boring integrals along the real line, then you're, at some point you learn this whole new vista of complex contour integration. String theory is a little bit like going from real numbers to complex numbers. So the world line formalism I bring up in uh, video 11 that I have not asked you to watch, but if you want, 
And Steve has some really nice papers on Worldline. I have a paper with Igor Buchberger and Oliver Schlatter where we compute Yang Mills amplitudes that are known using string methods. But when you're computing something challenging, it's good to have different independent ways to compute it. To me, this is a very strong motivation to think about string theory in the first place, just to understand quantum field theory better. And by the way, world line quantum electrodynamics, which of course is a very respectable and well-tested physical theory, is world line supersymmetric, reviewed, for example, in the beautiful review by Schubert that I discussed in video 11. Define a vertex operator. Mathematicians do have a theory that's under construction called vertex operator algebras. To me, this is a very interesting field that maybe quantum field theory could become more mathematically well-defined and easy for mathematicians to work on by having this kind of pretty big, as far as I'm concerned, structure. The way it differs from how we work in space-time in quantum field theory, we, from the get-go, allow composite quantum fields. So a photon, for example, will be represented by a vertex operator, and this zero here means that is in one of an infinite possible selection of pictures. And I will write a constant polarization vector. This is a constant polarization, just like a polarization of any photon, except this might be in 10 dimensions to start with. And then you have this dx. And this is at some position z, so I'm going to write z. And then you can have these extra terms. So this is a momentum in space-time. And this is also a constant from the point of view of z. Constant means it doesn't depend on z, which is my worksheet coordinate. This is actually now composite operator at the same point. So these fermions are Grassmann. So when you multiply two Grassmann numbers together, they become like an ordinary number. So you can add them together. This is just square root minus one. And then so somebody here was interested in condensed matter physics. This e to the i p x in condensed matter physics is called a spin wave. I discussed this in the reading guide. If you're interested, the reading guide to Polchinski in chapter two. This is discussed, for example, in Peskin and Schroeder's quantum field theory book. And uh, I recommend to look at that if you're not comfortable with this exponentiation of a quantum field. All right, so this is the definition so far. So when we compute our modular graph functions, our amplitudes, then what we're doing is really multiplying together a string of these and then computing expectation values. So you get these kind of, as we talked last time, these variances or should match this index. Thank you. And then these indices could also be new if you don't want to mix them up, maybe with that one. Sorry about that. So if you wanted a glue on, if you think photons are boring, it's very simple in string theory to get a gluon. You just multiply by a constant gauge matrix. So this vertex operator multiplied by constant gauge matrix. The default will be D equals 10 SO32, but you could put any kind of gauge matrix. And then you just multiply onto this vertex operator and you have a gluon. So the photon is represented like this on the world sheet and a gluon is represented with this extra thing. And then a graviton is represented as basically this two times with the psi replaced by psi tilde and the del x represented by del bar. So let me write that down. A graviton, you basically get the same thing, but you have another one where you have a tilde and the tilde means on the psi, you put a tilde and on the dx, you put a bar on the d. These are the basic uh, vertex operators that we'll be talking about. So that was the picture. Because of this symmetry, world sheet supersymmetry, there's an infinite degeneracy in how you represent a photon, for example. So a photon can represent in an infinite number of ways by acting with world sheet supersymmetry on this vertex operator. So this is just one possible representative. It turns out to be one that will be the most central to us, but there's an infinite number of other pictures that are minus one, zero, plus one, and so on. So I'm going to move on by first going back. So in video nine that we discussed yesterday, I argue that quantum field theory really leads us calculationally to inhomogeneous PDEs, in particular, the Laplace equation. And to be concrete, in Z coordinates, you get del, del Z bar. 
can we agree on a convention? Should we have a bar on this or not? So we can try to follow that convention. I'll probably forget right away. So I claimed in the video that the Green's function of this differential operator, something with a delta function by definition of what a Green's function is. Sometimes a delta function to emphasize that it's not holomorphic is written like z z bar, but I will tend to not, I'm just not writing out the z bar and the w bar. Now, if w here is non-zero, I try to explain in the video that w represents a quasi-periodicity. So that's particularly relevant if you have this example with the K3 surface that we talked about last time. So if you have an orbifold the representation of K3, then your map will be multivalued and you will capture the quasi-periodicity by having this W parameter be non-zero. But we could set it to zero and then we're back to the usual Laplace equation with a delta function on the right-hand side. It's not so important exactly what's here, but there's some little thing that is imaginary part WZ bar e to the two pi i over tau two, where tau two for me is always imaginary part of tau, where tau is the complex structure of the torus. So just like last time, I always represent the torus, which is our basic world sheet, by one and tau. Identify these and identify these. So what I mean here is that if this is gonna have quasi-periodicity, sometimes called twisted, but that word is overused in physics. It means many different things. So if this is twisted by W, then the delta function needs to also be twisted for consistency. It looks trivial at Z equals zero, but remember that you also have a delta function here and at every other lattice point. So you might need to keep this twisted delta function thing. So by the way, there's no extra term here. This extra term I made a big deal at last time. It was like plus one over tau or something. This is not there if W is not in Z plus tau Z. If W is not in the lattice, in the torus lattice, meaning one of these points, uh, then there is no such extra term. So this is what we have to do. We have to solve this PDE. And I already said in the video what the solution is and that we will spend the rest of the today trying to understand that and put it in context and hopefully maybe eventually generalize it. So now I get to automorphic forms. This is an automorphic form. So an automorphic form is invariant under some group G. So for me, the canonical example would be SL2Z. I think mathematicians would not be that interested if that was the only group for which this stuff appeared. My favorite reference for this is the book by Flag et al. that I gave on the course webpage the challenge we face when we try to discuss with mathematicians is that this definition I'm writing here, you will not find in this book. To me, automorphic means invariant under some Lie group, for example, G, although it has been generalized to non-Lie groups like Katz-Moody and so on. Here, my Lie group will typically be SL2Z or some possible identification thereof. The automorphic form satisfies a PDE, a differential equation, typically a partial differential equation, where the differential operator, which I can generically call D, is invariant. So the form itself is invariant, and the differential operator in the PD that it satisfies is invariant. And there's a fall off condition or some group of fall off conditions. And this is important. Sometimes in physics, we can be a little sloppy about this, but depending on what you pick, you may end up in a completely different class. So in video nine, I argue that this E1 is the Green's function as we see here. So we insert two Green's functions. You get this modular graph function on the world sheet. We have a Green's function here and a Green's function here. So this is a G. So this is how it always works in quantum field theory, but now it's a quantum field theory on the world sheet. So you think of a point here and they have a propagator, a Green's function uh, going that way. Sometimes in quantum field theory, we say propagator, we mean the Fourier transform, the Fourier space Green's function, but that shouldn't really be so important. You know, it's important that it's a Green's function. How you represent it is, is your choice, if it's Fourier space or not. If I put the W to zero, or W, I mean this W, the quasi periodicity, I get this integral. Mathematicians like to write this at the end, but I think most people are okay with where you put it. 
And then up to some constants, which I won't write, this gives you just E2 of 0, 0, and tau. Or by E2, I essentially mean the sum of m and n from minus infinity to plus infinity, excluding the m and n equals 0, 0 term. And this condition is sometimes is denoted by a prime. Here I put both just for good measure. And then imaginary part of tau to the power s, which in this case is 2, and then divided by m tau plus n to the 2s, which here I think should be then 4. And this now doesn't have the z because I integrated over the position on the world sheet torus. So it still depends on the complex structure of the world sheet torus. It no longer depends on where I am on the worksheet torus. So try to use some other color and say I have some marked point z. Uh, a marked point z by itself doesn't really make a lot of sense invariantly on the torus. So really what we typically mean is that we have fixed something at the origin and the z actually represents the distance from or the holomorphic distance from the origin. So now we've integrated over that. So now we no longer depend on it. And then we get this object, which is the simplest example of a modular graph function, modular graph function, or MGF. This is a fairly recent word in physics, but this is a very old concept in mathematics. It's a non-holomorphic Eisenstein series. So the non-holomorphic Eisenstein series in general has an S here, and has S there, and then has two S there. And this is a basic example of an automorphic form. It is easy to check that it's invariant under S of 2z by acting with the transformations we brought up last time on this object. And we get to the PD in a second. A generic correlation function, we have lots of greatest functions in different combinations. And then we integrate them, I'll get some more complicated functions that in general will not maybe be these particular object, but it could be combinations thereof. If you have a circle contraction of Green's functions, then it was done by Lerche, Schellikens, Nielsen, and Warner. It was computed that n Green's functions gave you E n for the fermions. There was a similar result by Stieberger and Taylor in 2002 for the fermion Green's function that also gives you an Eisenstein series as a result. So for some particular simple class of graphs, these are just non-homomorphic Eisenstein series, but in general, they could be more complicated objects that are not quite the standard monomorphic Eisenstein series. I need to talk about this second condition a little bit, and that will bring us to the real essence of, well, <laughs> what I consider the real essence of these things.